All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to our regular press conference and update. This is Josie McDaniel Burkett, who is with us today. We appreciate it very much. It'll be crowded, but come on in, ladies and gentlemen. Where's the chaplain? I'd like to call on Chaplain and Captain John Denny to lead us in prayer. Yes, sir. Come forward, please. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says, Go to the ant, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Let's pray. Gracious God, we humble ourselves to you and ask for your help. Help us to exercise sound judgment in our preparations for the storm. Help us to be wise in our decisions. Help draw us closer to each other and strengthen our bonds within our communities and as a state through our care for one another. Help us to use this event as a rallying point for unity. Help keep us safe, O oh Lord. Help us to honor and praise you even in the midst of the storm. Lastly, help us to remember that the same God that created the heavens and the earth is the same God that is with us and will see us through the storm. We ask all these things in your gracious name, Lord. South Carolina strong, South Carolina proud. Amen. Amen. John Quirillo, National Weather Service. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, there's some good news, and that's that Florence has weakened since yesterday and is now a Category 2 hurricane with winds of 105 miles an hour. However, don't think that just because it's weakened that the threat is over, and that's a really important fact here. It's still a large and dangerous hurricane. When you look at the size of the hurricane, the hurricane strength winds extend out to the west of the center 50 to 60 miles, and the tropical storm force winds extend west from the center 110 to 140 miles. So this is a very large hurricane. It's currently located about 175 miles east of Myrtle Beach. It is slowing down, now moving northwest about 10 miles an hour. We expect it to continue to slow down as it approaches the uh, coast of southeast North Carolina uh, today, making landfall likely somewhere in the Cape Fear Wilmington area tonight into early Friday. Uh, slight changes in the track and even in the intensity are still possible before landfall. It should weaken to a tropical storm while it slowly drifts into northeast South Carolina on, uh, into Saturday. Uh, after that, uh, it should sh slowly shift westward across South Carolina while weakening through Sunday night. Uh, outer rain bands and tropical storm winds arrive across the Grand Strand late this afternoon and evening. There will be a prolonged period of damaging winds in this area, with tropical storm force winds expected for nearly two days and hurricane winds expected much of Friday and Friday evening. Elsewhere, damaging winds could spread inland across much of the state on Friday and persist through the weekend, resulting in downed trees and power outages. Tropical storm force wind gusts are expected into the Midlands and the Low Country. Significant rainfall of 15 to potentially over 20 inches is expected across the Grand Strand, 8 to 15 inches in the PD, and then 4 to 10 inches in the Charleston, Columbia areas, and even into parts of the upstate, with lesser amounts across uh, uh, to the south of there. The heavy rain potential will persist into Monday, and given these rainfall totals, flash flooding is likely. These rainfall amounts will also result in significant river flooding, especially in the PD Basin through next week. Landslides could also occur in the South Carolina mountains. Storm surge is another concern as values could reach as high as four to six feet above ground level in some locations north of the Santee River, and two to four feet above ground level and some locations from South Santee River to Edisto Beach. A threat of isolated tornadoes also exists as Florence shifts across the state. Please make sure not to underestimate this powerful hurricane as much of the state will feel impacts of damaging winds and torrential rainfall for a couple of days, followed by potentially significant river flooding. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. And if you noted from those remarks and figures that what that means is the, the hurricane portion of the hurricane wind portion of the storm is almost 90 or 100 miles wide and altogether the the tropical wind 
winds and the hurricane winds are almost uh, just under 400 miles wide. And as he said, it's going to be moving at great velocity as it comes here, but also will be moving across the ground at a slow rate, which means all this rain is going to be here for about two days, starting at one side of the state and going to the other. Something else that you may not have heard before is that we may have landslides in the upstate as a result of this. And that's because I think it's about seven inches of rain may be expected in the upstate. So this is still a very, very dangerous storm, not only on the coast, but also in the, in the interior of the state. <clears throat> and the very unusual part is gonna last for about two days. So that means that we're gonna have to be patient because as we leave our homes, and we've now had over 421 people that we've counted, 21,000, 421,000 that have actually evacuated and we expect more, but the, there will be a, a, still, a, people will be on the roads, but we would say when, when it comes time for those winds to get to Myrtle Beach, that will be the first place they'll arrive, will be sometime this evening, that is at least uh, 39 or 40 miles an hour, it's time to get off of that road. And as the storm moves in, in Charleston tonight, you should not be on the road. And when it gets down to Beaufort sometime tomorrow, you should not be on the road. So if, you get, if you're going to leave, and you should leave, if you have not left these evacuation zones, you should leave now because time is running out. And remember this, once these winds start blowing at that tropical storm rate, it will be virtually impossible for the rescuers to get in to rescue you. So they will be leaving just like the others because it'll be highly dangerous to be there. So you, if you have not left, if you are in a place of danger, if you're in these zones, now is the time to go because that window of opportunity is closing on you very quickly. And if you stay in those zones, when the bridges may be overrun, there may be debris on bridges, there'll be Electrical lines will be down, possibly all over the state. There will be roads that will be closed because of trees across the roads. There'll be, some of the roads will be washed out. It will be very difficult for people to get in to fix those things until the winds have gone, the rain has subsided, and even then it will take days to do it. And the first responders will be the first ones to go in. They'll have to be cutting trees and trying to put up the power lines. So for, for those people, whether you are in those areas or you are outside of those areas, you should plan to be patient because you may not be leaving wherever you are for several days. It may take a week. It may two, take two or three days. We don't know. But we know that things will not be normal for many days. Highway 501 is now going in both directions as of noon today. I-26 will be going in both directions as of 6 o'clock p.m. today. But of course, we don't expect many people to be going into the area except first responders and those who are, are still setting up. As I mentioned, power will be out for a long time. Think about what you need for power. If you have a cell phone, it's not gonna last the length of time that it's going to take to get through this storm without being repowered. So you need to have an extra battery or some place to go that has plenty of power. I mentioned the trees are going to be down on the roads. The power lines are going to be down on the roads. Don't drive your car into a standing water on a road. There may be no road underneath that standing water. There may be a power line down under that standing water. This is enormously dangerous and also we may have flash floods so if you see a barricade do not go around the barricade and again don't try to take your well-known shortcut that usually works follow the signs follow the evacuation signs and again it's getting late to evacuate so if you are in one of these areas you need to go on and get out now again the power line crews the law officers and others will be the first to go back in uh, we will, uh, people will not be able to go back into their homes. We know everyone wants to get back to see what has happened and to take care of things, but that will not be possible until those areas have been cleared by the proper authorities. So we ask you please obey, what, obey their instructions because they are giving them for your safety. And finally, I'll say this, we are 
well aware of the tendency of some people to want to get in early and loot. There are thieves all over the place. And I, you can be assured that South Carolina law enforcement authorities in all of it, its different aspects will be on high alert for such. We want to keep our people safe, keep their property secure. General Livingston. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Governor and uh, people of South Carolina, Team South Carolina, from the state pers perspective, uh, we are set. We have maybe have a few minor adjustments, but we're set, ready for this storm. We need the rest of Team South Carolina, the citizens of South Carolina, to be set. The governor has made some very cautious decisions uh, to make sure that we don't gamble with people's lives and we don't want you to gamble with your life. Uh, we're continuing to coordinate with our neighbors to the north. Uh, both of our National Guards have about 3,000 uh, people activated at this time and we are able to exchange resources on the border. So as the storm comes across the border, uh, we're prepared to deal with that. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, sir. Christy Hall, Department of Transportation. Yes, Just like to give you a, a quick update on DOT and traffic operations in the state. Traffic has been relatively light this afternoon, and our, our traffic volumes have been dropping off steadily as a storm approaches. The reversals that have been put in place on I-26 and US-501 have functioned very well and operated as designed. I-26 in particular, through noon today, we moved an estimated 51,000 vehicles uh, with, since the evacuation time. That includes up to 400 vehicles per hour on the reverse side. As well, uh, for Tuesday, we had a peak of about 400 vehicles per hour Tuesday on I-26 reversal. And then yesterday, we had a peak of about 560 vehicles per hour using the reverse side on I-26. Without that reversal in place, we believe that we would have had a lot of congestion and slow-moving traffic on I-26, both Tuesday and Wednesday. With regards to US-501, through noon today, we've moved an estimated 33,000 vehicles out of the Myrtle Beach and PD area, including up to about 570 vehicles per hour, both Tuesday and Wednesday. So both days, we had about close to 600 vehicles per hour uh, movements on that facility. As the governor mentioned, we estimate that we've moved about 420, 21,000 evacuees out of the areas. We have about 3,000 DOT employees ready to respond to this event, including over 100 crews that have been specially assigned for debris removal operations once the storm passes. I'd like to encourage the public to check SEDOT's webpage as well as EMD's webpage for road closures as this event unfolds. Thank, Thank you, Governor. You. Thank you, ma'am. I'll point out again, there's the number. If you don't know whom to call, call that number. And if, if that's not the place to get the answer, you will be referred to the place to get the answer. Director Smith. Thank you, Governor. Leroy Smith, Department of Public Safety. As the governor, governor stated earlier, the uh, reverted southbound lanes of US 501 are now uh, open. Uh, the I-26 reverted lanes uh, will close today at uh, uh, 6 p.m. And as I stated uh, yesterday, if your vehicle is on the uh, reverted side in front of the uh, flush vehicles, you can continue the entire uh, route up to the uh, uh, Columbia uh, area. It's going to take us about four hours to break the uh, I-26 reverted, reverted lane down. And uh, again, we'll close that lane at 6 sometime. Uh, a few hours after that, we should have it uh, totally uh, completed. Uh, as I told you yesterday, uh, we investigated two minor collisions uh, on the reverted side of the uh, I-26 route, one in Orangeburg County, uh, one in Columbia. Uh, we also worked one minor collision, I'm sorry, Aner Police Department worked one minor collision on US-501 there in the uh, town of uh, Aner. Uh, our preparations are underway for our post-landfall uh, response. And I would just like to give you some public safety tips, something that you've heard the governor mention already. I think it's important to uh, reiterate those things just once more. Uh, in terms of post-landfall, uh, roadway conditions will be very dangerous. And, and if you don't have a need to be on the roadway, we ask that you please uh, stay off the roads. Uh, again, uh, the phrase, uh, turn around, don't drown, could not be more important than now. Uh, so don't drive around the barricades, as you heard the governor state earlier. 
Uh, don't drive in standing water. We know why. It could be down power lines, debris, uh, tree branches down, or the roadway could be washed out. And something else, uh, uh, don't uh, use or play in uh, standing water for recre recreational purposes. There could be a lot of safety risks uh, associated uh, uh, with that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Chief Keel, SLED. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Mark Keel, SLED Chief. I just want to say, as you've heard, uh, the evacuations and lane reversals are coming to an end. Those 450 state law enforcement uh, personnel who have been working with the lane reversals and evacuations will be transitioning to security assignments. We have already received a number of calls from local jurisdictions that are impacted by this storm uh, through evacuations or those that are looking to have potential damage. They're asking for additional law enforcement assistance. We will be providing that law enforcement assistance to those agencies with all of our partners, uh, state law enforcement partners and the National Guard. Again, as I've said each day, this is not the time for individuals to try and take advantage of those less fortunate, those who have had to evacuate from their homes or their businesses. Law enforcement will be out in force and there will be a zero tolerance for criminal activity. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. D. Heck, David Wilson. Thanks, sir. Sir, thank you, Governor. Uh, DHEC continues to perform pre-storm assessments of dams uh, across the state, focusing on those areas where we're expecting the highest amounts of rainfall. So far, we have assessed over 240 dams. Uh, for those that we need to keep closer attention on during the storm, we're partnering with the National Guard to do so. Again, at this time, I would still suggest that if you have a dam or an impoundment, before the weather gets bad this afternoon, if you can look at your primary spillway and emergency spillway and make sure they're clear and operational and, and free of debris. As it relates to our health care facility evacuations in the evacuation zone, most of those have been completed and the rest will be finishing up today. So far, we have successfully transported and evacuated over 2,200 patients. Thank you. Thank you. Director Joan Meacham, Department of Social Services. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to give an update on our shelter situation. As of 2 p.m., we had 61 total shelters open across the state. 49 of these were general population shelters and 12 were special medical needs shelters. We have one general population shelter that is at full capacity and that is Goose Creek High School in Berkeley County. We have one special medical needs shelter that is at capacity, and that's Carolina Medical Center in Florence, South Carolina. Currently, there are 4,358 clients in shelters across the state, 79 of which are special medical needs. Our current total sheltering capacity is at 35,602. We are at 12% of that capacity that leaves us with 31,324 spaces in shelters across the state at this time. As a reminder, if you are going to a shelter, check your SCEMD website for the live number of which is open or at capacity. Remember to bring blankets, pillows, and your comfort items, medicines if you have a chronic condition like high blood pressure or diabetes, important identification documents, and any special food items if you have small children or if you are on a restricted diet. Of course, service animals are allowed in shelters, and if you have a pet and it is not a pet-friendly shelter, the staff will assist you in locating that, that uh, a placement for your pet. We have four pet-friendly shelters that are now open. Blenheim Elementary and Middle School in Marlboro County, Kane, Kane's Bay High School in Berkeley County, DuPose Middle School in Dorchester County, and Lake Marion High School in Orangeburg County. And that concludes this update. Thank you. Thank you. Parks, Recreation, Tourism, Dwayne Parish. Thank you, Governor. For those evacuees who have not made arrangements for overnight accommodations, there are still rooms available throughout most of the state. If you have not made those arrangements, I would encourage you to go to a hotel's website, online travel agent sites, or short-term rental accommodation sites and check for availability. Thank you. Emily Farr, Labor Licensing and Regulation. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, State Fire continues to coordinate and prepare for the flooding that we anticipate with this storm. We now have four FEMA urban search and rescue teams along with one FEMA incident support team that is now working with our South Carolina resources as well as those that came from Tennessee and Louisiana. So we now have about 750 search rescue personnel ready to respond. Some of these teams are stationed here in Columbia and others are already in places closer to the coast and areas uh, where we anticipate flooding ready to respond as soon as the winds died down and it is safe to do so. Also wanted to let the public know that we do have important um, messages related to this storm on our agency website, llr.sc.gov. Again, that's llr.sc.gov. Um, we have a link right on the home page to some of these important messages from everything from our OSHA division for um, employer and worker safety messages. Um, messages from our licensing boards and the state fire marshal's office. Wanted to highlight one of those um, after the storm folks will be looking for property repairs. Um, they want to make sure that when you do that to uh, look for people or a business that you engage make sure that they are properly licensed with our state. Um, there's many insurance companies, agencies and organizations that that won't provide reimbursement assistance to property owners if you are using um, someone or a company that does not have a proper license in the state. You can find that important information along with how to look up licensees and who needs to be licensed um, at that website. We do also have an important message about how to remain fire safe during this storm. And so uh, I'd like to ask our State Fire Marshal Chief Jones to come forward and give that information to the public. Chief Jones. Thank you. Thank you ma Many areas of our state will likely experience uh, extended periods without power as a result of the storm and I want to offer a few safety tips uh, to prevent injuries, deaths and of course property loss um, as a result of those actions. First of all, avoid the use of candles for auxiliary lighting. It's best to use battery-powered flashlights or lanterns instead of candles or open, other open flames. And of course, I, I suspect that many people will be using generators. Um, make sure that you operate a generator in a well-ventilated uh, location that's outdoors, that's away from doors and windows. Never operate a generator uh, in an attached garage, even, even if the doors are open. Um, and also make sure that you place uh, generators so the exhaust fumes uh, are pointed away from any doors or windows on your home. Make sure that you have carbon monoxide uh, detectors and alarms in your home that will uh, indicate if there's a carbon monoxide buildup before it's too late. Um, and as a message to protect uh, our, our linemen and uh, power utility workers that will be uh, restoring power in the area, if your generator is hooked to the, the main breaker box of your home, make sure that you switch off the main breaker to your home before starting the generator because that power can backfeed back to the power lines and potentially injure the line workers that are working to restore your power. Make sure the appliances that you're operating off of that generator uh, do not overload the generator's capacity and make sure extension co cords used are not exposed to water. Please make sure, and we actually had a fatality last year uh, following Hurricane Irma as a result of this, make sure that you fuel your generator after it's cooled down and never run your generator inside your house. We actually had a fatality last year uh, after Irma because of a generator being run inside the house. And then experience has taught us uh, to uh, avoid cooking related uh, hazards uh, as a result of a hurricane and power loss. Make sure that the eye to your stove is turned off when the power goes off. Uh, we experienced, I remember back during Hugo, where the power went off while people were cooking and then they forgot that the, power, that the eye of the stove was left on, the power came back on when they weren't home or while they were sleeping and it started a kitchen fire. So make sure you turn the eye of the stove off. Never use portable uh, or uh, fuel-burning appliances inside your home and never burn charcoal uh, grills inside your home. So again, just some safety messages uh, to make sure that you stay safe and your property stays safe following power outages. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. You know, <clears throat> uh, what Chief Jones has pointed out is, and has been emphasized here before, is actually two phases to this, or two, two separate operations. One is facing the challenges 
presented by the wind and the very large surge that we know we're going to have and the, the rain and the water and, and all of that. But then once that is gone, then we have the recovery period where we have people without power and there are just as many dangers there as there are when the, the storm and the hurricane uh, are, are approaching. So we need to be very careful and, and be patient and follow the directions and advice of the professionals in this area. One of those, Libby Turner from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Libby? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> FEMA's here in support of a very strong and capable Team South Carolina as we plan and prepare for the potential impacts of Hurricane Florence. We have, we have here an incident management assistance team that includes our defense coordinating officer and his team and other federal agencies such as Health and Human Services, Department of Transportation, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Energy, and others as we work together to prepare and plan for the potential aftermath. We also have two incident support bases where we have supplies, uh, search and rescue teams, other commodities that might be needed after the storm. While we don't wish for impacts from this storm, we're honored to be here in support of the citizens of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and thank you, Mr. Turner. I need to add, we've also heard this morning from Secretary of Transportation, uh, Ms. Chow, uh, from Ben Carson, from we've heard from yesterday's Secretary of Commerce, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. I mean, we are, we are receiving plenty of attention and we appreciate it very much from the, the federal administration. Kim Stinson, Emergency Management Division. Yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. Um, obviously, we're still, the Seahawks still fully operational here and will be for the, certainly the near term. Our priorities here with the state emergency response team have not changed. Uh, we're still going through evacuation and sheltering. Uh, and then we're follow-on operations, uh, initial response, uh, re-entry, and initial damage assessment, and then also planning for flood operations. Right now at the uh, county level, there are uh, 22 county emergency operations centers that are open, and their primary focus continues to be evacuation and sheltering. In terms of logistics, uh, so far we've received 573 requests. Uh, 408 of those are uh, either complete or in progress and it ranges anywhere from uh, ambulances to buses to generators. We've got uh, seven teams from three different states that are on, uh, on the ground or will be on the ground this afternoon in incident management, swift water rescue and air support. And we've got seven others that are pending uh, and due to arrive here uh, in the near term. And that includes, includes additional air support, personnel and damage assessment. And right now there's a, there's a little over 200 uh, individuals from other states that are, uh, that are here right now. Um, we've got over 8,000 of tarps, uh, blue tarps in our inventory right now for temporary roof repair. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, over 275,000 sandbags that are available if we need them. Uh, we've already issued over 250,000 sandbags uh, out to the, at the county level. The most likely uh, response request that we're going to get here in the, in following the, uh, the, the, the arrival of tropical storm force winds is debris management generators and damage assessment so we expect to get those as we have in, a, have in the past and we continue to plan for sustainment operations for uh, both uh, emergency operation centers and teams because this is going to be a long uh, long uh, operation we fear uh, governor already talked about uh, the uh, public information phone system and that's at uh, 1-866-246-0133 and that's operational. They've taken over 5,000 calls right now, primarily evacuation and sheltering questions. Uh, several people have already mentioned it, but we've got our website, scemd.org. It still has lots of information. It's in disaster mode right now, so you can, as soon as you open it up, it's got all the important links that you need to, uh, to stay connected. Um, also, our emergency manager, uh, application uh, that's on your smartphone. We've got almost 100,000 downloads on that, but it has everything that uh, the website has and it allows you to uh, put in your own personal information um, so that you can stay connected. Uh, and with that, sir, that completes my brief. Thank you. Colonel Taylor, Alan Taylor, Department of Natural Resources. 
Thank you, Governor. As in yesterday, we realize that this is we're going to have a flood event. We're forecasting statewide heavy rainfall, so we're in the process of preparing not only our DNR officers but our state partners to respond to these communities where we have flooding conditions. One of the things, that when, a, when you have a flooded area, a flooded subdivision, it's even more vulnerable to looting. So we want everyone to know that we're going to be there uh, with our other state law enforcement partners to protect their property. If you're going to go boating while in the waterways, please be safe, be careful, travel at a slow speed. Just like on our highways, there'll be much debris in our waterways as you're in a boat, so it can be very hazardous. Um, our waterways during flood conditions, can the waters can be very swift and rapid, which causes another safety concern for boaters, especially if you're a boater with not much boating experience in this type of water. And please don't go sightseeing. Once again, please don't go sightseeing. So many times when we have these flooded areas, boaters will put their boats in the water to go look. And that, that just causes all types of problems, especially for those homeowners they may have water in their home or almost in their homes by boat wakes that will put water in their homes and cause much more damage. Um, we still anticipate our area of top priority to be the PD River Basin. Once again, the PD River Basin is our priority area for now simply because they will be receiving water not only from South Carolina rainfall but also North Carolina rainfall, all in that one river basin. We will continue to monitor other river basins. We, we are modeling now. Uh, we have some good ideas of areas that we need to be paying attention to. But once it starts raining, we'll have real-time modeling. We'll be able to be ahead of the flood waters and, and anticipate having all of our resources in place. So once again, be safe. Be careful if you're on the water. Our waterways during flood conditions can be hazardous just like our roadways. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Colonel. Director Jerry Edger, Probation, Parole, and Pardon. Thank you, Governor. Excuse me. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Anytime that you have a state of emergency in South Carolina like we have today, I just want you to know that all of the state law enforcement agencies, SLED, Department of Natural Resources, Department of Public Safety, as well as Probation, Parole, and Pardon Services, we come together and we work as one. Uh, you heard that the re lane reverse will be re uh, re completed today. Uh, that lead was by D DPS. We work with them on that. We will now transition to our post-storm uh, role, and that means that we will take the lead from SLED to work as one uh, to provide. Uh, our mission is the same, and that's to provide, uh, to protect, rather, all of the homes where there has been evacuation as well as save as many lives as we possibly can. This is not our first time doing this. The law enforcement agencies here are very experienced at this. And we look forward to carrying out this mission. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Kevin Suedo, Department of Motor Vehicles. Thank you, Governor. Department of Motor Vehicles' number one priority is to reestablish all the branch officers as soon as we can get safely back into them. Uh, for those that were not able to go ahead and uh, safely open with power, we have two uh, mobile capabilities. We use our CARES vehicle and our SHARK vehicles to go ahead and augment those, uh, those services. At an appropriate time, we will take those, uh, those resources and get them out to the uh, insurance claim site so that we have capability to get citizens, their driver's licenses, ID cards, and titles for appropriate claims. Uh, shifting gears, though, uh, it's an opportunity to talk about the South Carolina Disaster Recovery Office and uh, where the state has a world-class um, response element. I want to talk to everybody about uh, the requirement to get out there and recover. Uh, there is not, are not, abundant office, uh, uh, resources to get out there and recover each of the homes that are going to be impacted by this, uh, this flood. And as a result, um, the priority will go through the uh, South Carolina Disaster Recovery Office to the most vulnerable people in the state, primarily those individuals that are uh, bottom third of poor, uh, they are disabled, and they're age, age dependent. That means that if you are able-bodied, you are going to be responsible particularly for the initial recovery that comes from your home. That means being prepared for the recovery itself. That means going out and buying things like mops, buckets, uh, Clorox, gloves, and, uh, and contractor trash bags 
so that you can go ahead and get rid of the trash and the water as fast as humanly possible so that you can uh, mitigate the impacts of things like mold and mildew that will take over a home if you're not careful. Uh, the last thing that we use is a lesson learned that I'll throw out this time. A lot of you are going to be exposed to a lot of time outside at this point in time, and it is mosquito season, and this is the time to go out pre-storm and buy the bug spray so that you're properly protected. They're going to be out there like they have been each of the pre uh, prior storms, and we want you to go out and start buying that, uh, that stuff so you can protect yourself now. Sir, subject to your questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. And in that vein, we've also been in contact with uh, Secretary Linda McMahon of the Small Business Administration, and they are, they are ready to provide assistance in recovery as well. Director Nanette Edwards, Office of Regulatory Staff. Thank you, Governor. Um, well, as been stated several times earlier in this briefing and, and addressed by uh, the Governor, we are anticipating that with the current projections of this storm, we could have extended power outages. The reason for that is the crews cannot go out and begin restoration efforts until it is safe to do so. And because we now understand that the winds can be 30 miles per hour and greater for a sustained period of time, the utility crews cannot go out until um, it is safe to do so. So for example, if you were to lose power on Thursday, it could be several days before your power could be restored. Um, and Along those lines, if you choose to remain in place, please make sure that you are prepared for that extended power outage. Make sure that you have batteries. If you rely on a cell phone, make sure that you have your extra battery charged. Um, take those precautions. Um, we urge you to do so. Um, the Office of Regulatory Staff is also continuing to work with our fuel partners to make sure that there are adequate fuel supplies for any continued evacuation. Thank you. And we've also heard from Duke, uh, SCENG, uh, and uh, Santee Cooper, and they are making the same plans that, that everyone else is to address these problems and the, the fixing that will take place after the storm leaves. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Can I get maybe Colonel Taylor to address more specifics on concerns for river flooding when and yes, where? Yes, ma'am. Well, we know from past experience and from the models we are currently running that the highest area of vulnerability will be the PD Basin. There's no question about that. They are positioned and projected to have the greatest amount of rainfall over the shortest period of time. We have many small rivers that feed into that basin, both the Little PD and Lumber River. Um, take water out of North Carolina and it comes down and, and, and exits into the PD River. And we also have the Waccamaw River, which receives water from North Carolina as well, which at the end of that river, again, is the Great PD. So the Great PD takes a lot of water from a lot of different rivers along that basin. So we know that it is the most vulnerable. It is our top priority. We know we're going to have much rain in North Carolina, and we know we're going to have much rain along that PD area of our state, the highest projected area. So that's our top priority. We'll move down to the Catawba River Basin, um, anticipating the area that may have the second largest amount of rain volume, and, and we're modeling that, and we'll closely monitor it as well. Those are our top two priorities presently, but we will continue to look at Edisto Basin around Givans and the lower part of the state and, and our other river basins. We get real-time information when it starts raining. We can plan and we're planning. We know where we think the highest priority should be. But once it starts raining, then we get real-time information and we can react to that in a hurry, in a hurry you know, because we'll be monitoring. Any outlook for Midlands River areas like the uh, the Congaree? Well, the Con we'll be looking at the Congaree. As you also know, you've probably seen that SCNG is, spend is spilling money now, anticipating um, being able to hold a greater capacity of water from rain. Um, and we've received some calls uh, just today from residents that saw the Congaree and also the Great PD come up overnight. And they said, oh, no, why is the river rising? Because it hasn't started raining yet. Is it raining upstream? Well, what, what that is is preparation to be able to accept water. Um, our utilities, 
uh, have learned from the past as well, and, and they, are, they spill water ahead of time, which may have caused a river downstream to go up temporarily, but that water would be flushed and the river would go back down, and then the whole system can take and adequately as best possible um, take care of that water it comes in from rain. So too early to, to tell what Midland areas will look no, we, we, we are prepared, we're looking, we're modeling, but at the end of the day, when it starts raining, not much is going to depend on how much rain falls in one particular area. You know, most of these storms, rain falls in bands around these tropical storms, so one area may have a, a 15 inches of rain and 20 miles down the road, you may have five. So a lot's going to depend on how much rain falls where, and we'll be monitoring that on a regular basis to try to, um, to, to model and, and, and be prepared to react to what happens. But we do know it'll likely be raining for two days, which is longer than usual. Yes, sir, Governor. This is, we know this is a rain event. I mean, we, we still have a storm that hasn't gotten here yet. But we, one thing we do know that this is going to be a rain event for South Carolina, a great rain event for South Carolina. So we're monitoring that now, making plans, have personnel in position. And whether, whether you say you're fortunate or unfortunate, we've done this before. Um, on one side, we're fortunate because we've had plenty of, of real-time training in response to, to responding to these type of events in the past. Unfortunate because it's a tragic event. But how might this compare to the fire hose that came at us with Hurricane um, Joaquin back in 2015? Well, when Joaquin came at us in 2015, I would say that we weren't prepared. We were, we were not uh, prepared for the amount of rain that fell. Much of the rain uh, prognosis that time, um, we weren't looking at the amount of rain that fell. It wasn't forecast. And when Joaquin set up over us for a period of time and it rained, it rained. So I think now, although some situations may be similar, I think now we're more prepared to monitor, to react, to forecast than maybe we were during Joaquin. Governor, I want to... In addition, we have technologies now that we didn't have before. Uh, Wilbur Ross was explaining how Secretary of Commerce is we have drones in the air, have submarines or some sort of submarine drones out in the ocean now bringing in data about this storm and uh, have a satellite technology that didn't exist just a few years ago. And Bob McAllister is here in the, in the room with us, or was a few minutes ago, back when, when Hugo came in 1989. Uh, he and Governor Campbell were, were sitting at the State House trying to get as much information as they could. There wasn't that much available, and they made their main decision based on Jim Gandy at WIS-TV, who was, was an excellent weatherman. Things have changed a lot. We can still predict a lot, but this particular storm is unpredictable. Things have already changed so many times, but uh, we're as prepared now in this state with this team that we have, this, South, this team South Carolina, we're as prepared as anyone in the country and probably more so. For these kind of events. Governor, okay. would uh, anybody here be able to address that prison situation? Has Have any of them been evacuated in those No, so they, they, have, they have not been. Nothing has changed since Why yesterday. Not? Well, the same reasons as yesterday. The uh, If you look at the, the, the prison buildings in question, there's only one, I believe, that is in the evacuation zone, and uh, that's McDougal, and it's right on the edge of the zone, right on, almost on the, uh, right on the line, and uh, those buildings are, are sturdy, and are as, as good a place, uh, possibly better, uh, to be in terms of, of that kind of safety from, from winds uh, and rain. And we're working closely with Director Sterling and others to determine what the best thing is to do. And at this time, the best thing to do is to stay on campus as the safest enough, place. Will they have enough security personnel if yes. something does happen? They will, yes. When it yes, comes sir. to the uh, Red Cross shelters, we're getting word that uh, a lot of the shelters don't have food, they don't have beds, they don't have water. Are there any efforts uh, yes, to get those items to those shelters? Yes, um, the mass feeding uh, has been activated and food has been ordered and it's, and it's currently going out as far as it can before the road shut down and then it'll go to uh, various distribution points. As far as the bedding, I know that they're in process of trying to get cots into the shelters. I know that local EMDs and the Red Cross are working. I don't know the numbers or the exact shelter locations where COTS are at this time. So 
it starts from Columbia and then kind of works out to where? Uh, the food distribution, Kim. It, it, yeah, it starts here in Right. There's yes. a state. There is a statewide plan that is being implemented and is being perfected as we as we go in conditions required. We've been on the phone this morning. It was discussions with uh, Louise Welch of the of the Red Cross and uh, and things are proceeding well. Yes, sir. There was another question. Was another question, the Colonel? The Colonel, I was I was going to address the on uh, Department of Corrections question. We're in constant contact with all of our modeling and we're giving that information to them as they make their plans as well. So they aren't out there operating in a vacuum. We're, any of our models and information that we have for our rescue team and for our enforcement team, we're also sending to them so they can prepare. Yes. Thank you, Governor. I wanted to follow up on something that uh, Colonel Taylor's been talking about and, and John and, and the Governor. Uh, this is a long-term event, and it's, it's almost in two phases. The first phase is going to be the hurricane coming through or the tropical storm. There's going to be a lot of wind, a lot of rain, flash flooding, and things like that. While that rain is still coming down for a couple of days, one to two days later, you're going to have stuff coming from North Carolina. You're going to have things coming in from the upstate. So you're going to end up with a river flooding condition. So just because the rain starts letting up, don't assume everything's good and you go back to your house in some low-lying area and then be surprised by the river coming up. So it's, it's one of those things of you got to be situationally aware. So make sure that you've got a battery-powered radio, a weather radio, and that you uh, purposely try to find out information before you start considering returning home. Uh, because this is something that's going to be extended and you're going to see at least two waves of damage coming through. And, and this may be the first time we've experienced such a two punch from these, these kind of conditions. So yes, ma'am. We don't know. Okay. Yes. Sir. Any updates on? Okay. Go ahead. What's that? What was the question? When might people come, be able to come home? How about the roof? Um, well, once the storm passes, we'll uh, go out and do the assessment in order to try to get the lanes reopened, do a safety check of our bridges. That'll be one of the first things that we do right away. We'll, we'll uh, be positioned to be able to fly our bridge inspectors around to check the critical bridges. And we'll also be looking at our roadways uh, to see, to make sure that the roadways are able to support the traffic as it comes back in from uh, making sure that nothing's washed out or any of our bridges are incapacitated. And that'll be done in advance of the reentry order um, as as the governor uh, deems appropriate to move back. That's in. why you have to watch those barricades and watch the warning signs. Governor Mr. Stimson, let's get Kim, Kim Stimson and we'll come. Yeah, just talk a little bit about the reentry process is we'll work very closely with the county administrators and the local emergency managers on when it's safe to come back in, when they feel like they can receive their population back into their area, they'll make a recommendation to the governor and then, of course, the, the CERT will also make an additional recommendation, but it will all be very carefully orchestrated uh, and certainly not a unilateral uh, decision, but give good information to the governor on that when it's safe. Yes, sir. General? Uh, we, we have to, as citizens of South Carolina, we have to realize this, is, this event's going to go well into next week, and we don't know how much the storm's going to slow down. Uh, we don't know exactly where the flooding is going to be because, uh, as uh, Director Taylor talked about, uh, it's according to exactly where it rains rather than just generally where it rains. So uh, we really don't know. And this thing, thing goes back into uh, what uh, Director Stenson talks about is it's got to be the local uh, leaders as they assess the situation to make that determination. But this is going to, the event itself is going to go in the next week then we start looking at when to come back home. So it's, it's going to be a while. So to clarify, that would ultimately be a state decision for specific areas as to when they can come back? You want me to answer that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, normally, uh, the governor will assess the state along with his team, but it will be back to the local uh, officials to determine locally when it's safe to return. So they'll provide input. We may open major highways based on everybody's input, but it's the local officials that will make that determination because they're best to make it because they're on the ground. So they'll make the call. They'll make the call. That's right. And it'll be communicated. Ms. Hall? Yes, sir. Just want to provide some uh, clarity on the reversals. 
Um, we're removing the reversals because of the approach of tropical storm force winds. And so uh, we're breaking those down as we did on 501 earlier with our partners with DPS in order to retreat from the area and get safe harbor for our employees and our uh, workers. So we'll be ready to go back out uh, whenever the storm passes. That does not mean that the evacuation order has been lifted just because we've moved out of that area. The same thing is gonna apply for I-26 as we remove those employees and kind of unwind that reversal situation this afternoon and early evening that does not mean that the evacuation order has been lifted for the charleston area just to make sure that that's clear to everybody you will we, we would you, be very clear when the evacuation order has been been lifted and we'd ask everybody to stay tuned there are, there are a lot of questions uh, there are a lot of different questions that can come up between now and tonight and tomorrow but uh, many of them can be answered by, by calling that number, at least as a starting place. More, more questions? Sorry, we, we heard earlier that there are estimates that uh, there are about a million people that may need to evacuate, and we heard that uh, about 420,000 already have. Any idea um, you know, how many people may need to be rescued or are in harm's way? Well, be rescued. Uh, time is running out for rescue because the rescuers are going to be standing down when these winds uh, get much, much higher. Would you like to address that? Yes, sir, I'd be glad to. Excuse me. So as the governor said, and many have said before, you have to take your own personal responsibility and make sure that you're planning ahead uh, and making your decisions on whether to, 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 to depart the area or not to depart the area. Um, if you decide to stay, just be reminded if you're in an evacuation zone, that help may not be able to get to you, especially during the event. So keep all that in mind as you make as you make your decisions on what you and your family are going to do this evening. Um, we believe in the Myrtle Beach area that there has been uh, significant um, participation by the locals in the evacuation. We believe we achieved somewhere between 70 to 75 percent on the evacuation. Uh, people evacuating or complying with the evacuation order, which was very good to see. As, of course, you can see from the, the storm forecast, they're looking at the same information that, that we are as well and making those decisions based on that and uh, making sure that they're, they and their family will be safe. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Jim. Anything you can say about schools, Governor? Are we on the no, same? Okay. Uh, as far as the estimates on, on, the, on the evacuating people is, is that we originally had the million figure because it was going to be a full coastal evacuation involving the entire coast. Uh, but because we are not including uh, Beaufort, Colleton, and Jasper right now, it's probably closer to 750,000 people that are in those evacuation zones that should evacuate. Just getting back to my, uh, my Red Cross question, you know, these people were asked to evacuate their homes and then they get to the Red Cross and there's no place for them to sleep. Would you say that this is, 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 is acceptable? Well, there is a place for them to sleep. If they're in a shelter, there's a place for them to sleep. Well, there are mats on the floors, and we're getting the cots there as quickly as we can. From the very beginning, we've been urging people, if they want to go to a, a shelter, particularly uh, early, which many of them have, have done, is to take with them some bedding of some kind to make it more comfortable until the cots arrive. But I assure you that the, the, the plan is being implemented and perfected to get those cots that have not already been delivered to get them delivered to, to be there for the people. And we don't want to have a, have extra cots in one place and not enough in the other. So it, it's a, a, a precision contest to get it to the right place. Any more information on the schools? Any more schools are same same as has been. Nothing's changed. Yes? I have a question for FEMA. Is she still around? She is. Ms. Turner? Yes, sir. So the Navy says that they have two ships south of here ready for us if we need it, if FEMA specifically asks for the help. Does it need to be a specific amount of destruction to occur for y'all to do that, or, or what's the likelihood? No, we don't, we don't base our assistant, assistance based on the amount of destruction. Uh, it, it's actually a kind of a reverse process of that. So wh whatever occurs, whatever the impacts are, that then create needs, we, we base our assistance on those needs. So if the locals and the state need assistance in meeting those needs, then they come to us and request it. We can look at contracting or within our own resources, other federal agencies, a lot of times voluntary organizations. They're first and last on the ground helping people. But if all of those assets are not available or not enough, then we can reach to our partners at the Department of Defense. 
And so these ships are standing by, ready to assist if needed for any of the states that may be impacted by the disaster. Governor, uh, City of Thank Columbia you. Canal, are you guys working to secure that, uh, given what happened in 2015? Can you take me through that? That, that would be a question for the, the, for the city and, and uh, Mr. Benjamin, the mayor. I know it's, <clears throat> there's $169 million, I think, that has, has not arrived yet to work on that canal, but it is, uh, it is being um, uh, pursued vigorously, I assure you. Sure. And the, last. It, the lady reminded me of one other thing. is Let's don't forget the, the impact of volunteers. There, there are more volunteers helping with this effort than there are uh, people in, in the various governments. We've got a very, and that includes the, Romp, the um, Red Cross and Harvest Hope and the Salvation Army, all these others, and many, many volunteer organizations, as well as individuals who are delivering food and bedding and those other things uh, that are, are making this entire effort uh, work. Yes, Yes, we've been in contact with uh, city officials, and they're taking a look at the, the weather predictions and the flooding predictions, and they've, they've got a, a plan if they have to further draw down the canal. They've already drawn it down some, but they, they can draw it down. They've got uh, equipment and, uh, um, I guess, riprap and that sort of thing that's available, and we're in contact with them if something happens, and uh, that's certainly on everybody's radar. We, we, we've actually made coordination through the military. Step up, step up. Uh, we, we've actually made coordination through uh, the military side too. So, uh, yes, that, that was one of the great concerns uh, five days ago. As you can tell, this plan we have is is comprehensive. Are there any more questions? Governor, uh, the, uh, the coast has been on guard for, for several days now. You obviously ordered the evacuation along the coast several days ago. But, uh, you know, there's been a tropical storm watch issued as, as far east as, as Sumter at this point. I think it's the first time the Columbia office has been issuing tropical storm watches from, from inland. For folks who residents in the inland uh, who may think that they are out of harm's way because they are 100 miles away from the coast, um, well, what's your message to them about what they should be watching? Well, the most recent part of that message started about 30 minutes ago when we started this, this press conference, and it has been in every one that we've had so far and probably in most of the weather reports, and that is that the, unpredictably, the unpredictability of this storm has been demonstrated so far. The strength of this storm and the hurricane uh, has been demonstrated as we see now. The, this is, as we've said, this is a different kind of hurricane. This is not one that's gonna, gonna hit the coast and pass through quickly. This is one that's gonna hit the coast and stay, maybe for two days and it's gonna be staying right over South Carolina, moving from uh, Myrtle Beach and that part of North Carolina on across to where we even expected maybe seven inches of rain up in uh, Caesar's Head and, and around there, around uh, the North Carolina line there. I don't know that we've had anything like that uh, in anyone's memory, and that could even lead to, to mudslides in that area. So there's gonna be plenty of rain, there's gonna be a lot of it, and we need to be prepared and for, of course, the flooding that results from that kind of rain. And as been mentioned, we have the rain that is falling in North Carolina, that's very heavy, that will be coming down through South Carolina, into the PD especially, some into the Catawba Basin, which runs through the center of the state, but we're gonna have rain all over the state. Thank that, you. From one side to the other for possibly two days. Thank you, guys. Thank you.